Um, I'm required, so I'll do this right away before I forget, to give you the uh, standard disclaimer. I work for IBM. I don't set corporate policy. And in particular, although we're working closely with Linden Lab, I don't speak for Linden Lab, and I certainly don't set Linden Lab's policy. Um, so with that out of the way, let's go ahead. Okay, yeah, that's great. That, uh, that, na- now I can ask you anything, and you can uh, be outrageous. Uh, so, you, you, Ja, you've been c- quite a topic in the Second Life blogosphere lately because of the recent announcement that you teleported from servers that were controlled by Linden Lab, uh, S- Second Life as we know it, to OpenSim servers that have been reverse engineered to mimic the functionality of Second Life's servers. So uh, other than making you the Neil Armstrong of the metaverse, uh, why is this development important? Well, I I actually should start with two quick clarifications. Uh, Reverse engineered is probably um, deeply disingenuous or wrong. And it's it's an independently developed thing which has worked closely sometimes with Linden Labs, sometimes separately from Linden Labs to duplicate the function of, of a large portion of what Second Life does. The OpenSim project I think would find it somewhat offensive to have it described as merely reverse engineering. There's a lot of very creative original programming there. Um, and second of all, it's not the main grid, in case anyone's wondering. What we, what we demonstrated as a proof of concept was teleporting between a test grid that Linden Lab has set up specifically for this purpose and a small number of servers that IBM is hosting on OpenSim, which is say, based in the OpenSim software, in order to demonstrate this. As to why it's important... Um, it's one of several steps I think we're going to see over the next several years to get virtual worlds away from being something of oddities in closed gardens and into a much broader part of the interweb, uh, where we're going to see content um, creators have a bigger audience. We're going to see a lot of innovation that happens in parallel within Second Life and immediately surrounding Second Life. And also as a way to get corporations and educational institutions and governmental institutions opportunities to build their deployments in ways which are separate from but coupled to parts of of Second Life's grid. And I think all of those developments are very exciting and very important. Now, one of the things that I've heard uh, pe- people who represent enterprises say is, well, we can't really use Second Life because everything we do there uh, – is on Second Life's server. They can't. They or others can listen in. We don't have the security that our lawyers require us to have, and, and maybe even that our uh, local law requires us to have in order to, you know, keep keep our communications secure. Uh, so, so when you say these are on IBM servers, you uh, you you would then have that type of security after you've taken that teleport uh, into the Right. Audience, uh, exactly. And this is an ongoing process. At the moment, we're, we're nowhere near where, where that teleport gives you anything like a complete connection to something that feels like or looks like Second Life or has the same functionality, though it's certainly converging on that. But the, the, the interesting point is, once you've taken that teleport, you're hosted on a box which can be placed behind a firewall, can be managed by your IT personnel, and can in particular, handle things like your data retention and security policies. Now, there are a ton of related security, privacy, and policy issues that that come up as soon as you do that. And so, for example, you'll notice if you've seen the video that Torley pulled of of the demo work that everybody shows up as default avatars, not wearing clothing, not looking like their, their typical second lifestyle. That's because, in fact, in the proof of concept work, we didn't even pretend that we were going to tackle those problems. We were just tackling login and teleport. Um, moving assets, handling permissions, setting policy, and determining exactly how we're going to eventually grow out a grid of connected, um, and I hate the word virtual world, but connected regions and hosting and so on is, is going to be an ongoing process. Not, this is not suddenly you throw a switch and instantly you can teleport and bring all of your clothing and avatar um, assets with you. Mm-hmm. And I, about how far do you think we are uh, realistically from, ha- assuming the policies can be nailed down, uh, just from the technical perspective, uh, what's the timeline? Um, there isn't a precise timeline. Um, we are very much approaching this as an engineering exercise, which means we're building and testing and exploring what the impediments are to the approach, what the challenges are in the approach. I would guess as an engineer, and this is speaking strictly from the technical side, the programming part of this is the easiest part. The hardest part is policy 
and somewhat to an extent socialization to make sure that we have the right structures in place to protect content and protect uh, the creative rights of the people who built content. That's absolutely fundamental to making this work. One of the things that I personally believe um, is part of the secret sauce that makes Second Life compelling is the rich content creation and the fact that people are rewarded for that. And so making that right is, is, is fundamental to this. Also, although teleport looks easy, it's actually, in fact, in some sense, the trivial part of this, because that's merely getting your presence across the wire, fetching assets, managing assets, and so on, requires a, you know, substantial care and attention that hasn't been, hasn't been done in terms of engineering. We did teleport first because of engineering considerations. You can't pursue some of the other pieces without that. Okay. Um, the uh, Let's see. I'd like to follow up, I think, with the policy issues that you referred to. Um, there's There's been a lot of talk uh, about intellectual property rights, and in particular, I had uh, three different people today express concern about a, a, a very specific thing uh, that, that this type of transport would make possible, and that is that uh, someone could take an item uh, out of of Second Life and onto another grid that doesn't have copy protection built in. They could open that item up, modify it, repackage it, do whatever they want, bring it back into Second Life as a, an illegitimate copy. Uh, so what, what are the thoughts, what are your thoughts uh, on how to address this problem? Okay, well, let's, let's start with two specific specific issues there. Uh, one of which is making the connection and, and all of that and how that's exactly going to be mediated is going to end up being uh, policy and decisions set by the, the grid hosters. In the case of Second Life, obviously, Linden Lab. Um, just because the OpenSim software um, does or doesn't permit certain things to be built, and in fact, OpenSim software could be configured a number of different ways, doesn't mean that anyone who has an OpenSim after we do some interoperability work, we'll suddenly have direct access to Linden Lab's asset server. Um, just as a technical matter, that asset server lives behind a firewall, and you know, you'd actually have to have a defined agreement with Linden Lab to give, get them to give you access to their assets. It's not as if, as if suddenly having this protocol worked out and even tested would suddenly solve, you know, this ma magically make those security issues which were put in place for exactly this reason go away. Uh, secondly, there's nothing inherent in what the interop work is doing that makes it easier or harder to engage in theft of, of content or, if you prefer, infringement of copyright than you can do with the client today. The, the end constraints on those are always legal. The technical reality is that the client today lets people who wish to engage in unscrupulous behavior do certain things because of the fact that the moment a texture is presented to 25 clients, it's sitting physically in the graphics memory of those 25 clients and people can do things. Um, that's a fundamental hard fact of life that we all sort of look at reluctantly and say, there's not a lot we can do about it. If I want you to see my shirt, then that texture is going to be visible on your client. Um, nothing we're doing changes that, and in particular, the protections which exist today, which are fundamentally that there's a legal constraint against your copying that aren't going to change. And again, I can't speak for Linden Lab's policies. The technical underpinnings will allow us to express those policies, mark content with people's intent, and I would assume that rational, um, sane grid providers are going to sign agreements with each other that let them protect their legal rights. Um, it would be odd, I would think, at best, and foolhardy is another word that comes to mind, to set those sorts of things up in ways that don't protect your legal rights. And that includes, for example, obviously, content that um, Linden Labs has, has licensed under the current terms of service isn't explicitly marked as necessarily takeable off the grid, in which case that defines a constraint that, they, that you know, optimal, you know, that in terms of deploying a service you may have to live with. Mm -hmm. 